But it goes away when you talk, so it's not really that bad, really. Yeah, I don't know. We're new to this technology thing as well. Yeah, I'm real new to it. I don't like it. <laughs> well, today we have a pretty cool guest on the podcast. We have Jake Engler, who is a pretty well-known farrier in the industry, and get a pretty cool conversation to talk with him today. So, why don't you uh, kind of fill us in, Jake, on when did you get a start on shoeing horses? Well, I grew up shoeing horses with my dad. I don't even know. Like, I was probably in middle school. I guess, uh, like, you know, when I had time off and stuff, I'd always ride with him and and uh, go shooting with my dad. But then after high school, like, I went to college for a couple years and started shooting full time. You know, I guess I was probably in my early 20s. Yeah. After my, my folks moved, they moved back to the Northwest. We were in Texas, and my folks moved back to the Northwest. And I stayed here and shot horses, and they moved back when I was in my early 20s. That's when I started full-time. So a long time ago at this point. So when you were working with, like, your dad, was he, like, competing at that stage or anything like that? Yeah, when I was pretty little. <coughs> excuse me. When I was pretty little, he was competing a fair amount. When I was, As I got older, we did some, but then, like... Uh, as it got closer to him moving back to Washington like that, he really didn't compete too much then. So we went to a fair amount of, you know, clinics and things like that. And that was when uh, your dad was still shooting horses like down in Houston area? Yeah, yeah, he shot a lot of horses around there. Okay. So was being a horseshoer something that you wanted to do or like when you were younger? Or was it kind of just a chore of going with your dad? No, I, I always, you know, as I got a little older, I, that's kind of what I wanted to do. Um, when I was real small, I, I think that there wasn't a babysitter in town that would stay home if I was there. So I was made to go with my dad. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> like my brothers and sisters, like, you know, I had to go with my dad because the babysitter was like, no, we won't stay with that devil, but we'll stay with these <laughs> other ones. And then I <laughs> kicked into the truck with my dad. So anyway. That's... I always thought my dad liked me, but it turns out, like, nobody would watch me, so that's where I ended up. <clears throat> Were you just kind of a terror of a little kid? I don't know, I guess. I thought I was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought my dad, I thought my dad wanted me to go along, you know, like, oh, yeah, this is the one I like. Let's take him along. Well, it turns out, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know just until I was, like, 30 here. or 35, you know. He, he tells me, like, no, no, that wasn't it at all, just so you know. <laughs> Like nobody, nobody would watch the kids if you were home with them, so you had to go. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> How many brothers and sisters anyway. did you have? I got two brothers and a sister. Two little brothers and an older sister. Okay. Oh, okay. But, and only one of them shoots horses, right? Or do they? Yeah, only yeah, one. Yeah, my Jesse. youngest brother, Jesse, still shoots horses, and uh, he's a firefighter, a firefighter in Houston, and then he shoots horses three, four days a week. And then my middle brother, I don't know if he still trims some or not. He can, but he doesn't, yeah. doesn't so much, you know. And my wife as well. She can shoot horses. She's a uh, AFA certified farrier. Kate is? Yeah. That's how I met her. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. So if yeah. you're in desperate need of help, you can just take her along with you? Oh, yeah. Live in, wrench, and clench. That's the way to go. <laughs> what did you go to college when for? When we first got married... I never finished it's really to be I mean I just went through the first couple of years and got all my basic stuff done and then decided I was going to make my fortune shoeing horses yeah. so I quit what did you <laughs> where really, did you want to be that's why I quit I oh know. yeah that's a legit reason <laughs> so, I got through all the basic stuff and then I was like well yeah, what am I going to do now so, well get rich shoeing horses that was the same for me when I started college. It's, I didn't know what I wanted to study. Just kind of got handed to it, like, just try the horseshoe, and then here I am. Yeah, it's a good trade, you know. It's, uh, it's a lot of hard work, but I think if you're disciplined, you can, you can get by. You can do okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So did you grow up with horses, like you guys screwing around with them quite a bit? Not really. Like, we didn't ever have any at the house. Um, 
We'd, we'd take some riding lessons and stuff. Dad would swap shoe on a, you know, some of the facilities. You could ride if you wanted to, but I didn't really have much interest in riding, to be honest with you. You don't have any horses now? Yeah, we got three. My wife rides a lot. Oh, really? Kate does. Nice. Two of the ugliest horses in Texas, and then, like, one of them's pretty nice, cute little horse. But they're good with the kids, the ugly ones. <laughs> the ugly ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least I got something going for him. Yeah. yeah. I didn't quite know why we had him, and then I seen the kids riding him. I was like, oh, I get it. Yeah. yeah How many kids sense. you got? Yep. We've got two boys, Ian and Jonah. How old are they? They're 12 and 10. Oh, man. Yeah, 12 and 10. Yep. Are they, well, are they we little were, tears uh, like you are? On the, like you were? <laughs> uh, not yet, but oh, I'm sure good. it's coming. You know. Time will tell. It takes a little while to set in. <laughs> We were on the line with uh, Patrick and Mackenzie Dutton last week, and they told us to ask you a funny story about the motorcycle scooter incident. And I think it was oh, with yeah. one of your uh, kids. Oh, yeah, Jonah, uh, we went out to dinner one night, <laughs> and I came home, and there's this huge box at the, at the gate. We had, like, a, a long driveway. And then the Amazon guy drops all the packages at the gate, and I, I, I looked at Kate and said, hey, did you order something? He says, no, nah, I didn't order anything. I thought it was you. I said, no, it's not me. And Jonah in the back, he's probably like, I don't know, five or six. He says, oh, yes, that's my new motorbike. <laughs> he had ordered a motorcycle, a helmet, gloves, and uh, goggles. Pretty sweet. <laughs> He's ordered one by himself online? Yeah, buy now button. Hit it. Let's go. God damn. Get my motorbike and go. Well, and, you know, Amazon sends you like 32 emails. Your package is on the way. I thought Kate had ordered something. And she thought yeah. I had ordered something. <laughs> Nobody looked at it until it got here. But here he just ordered himself his own motorcycle. Yeah, it was like a thousand bucks. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah, what does he I do thought. for work? <laughs> yeah. I got sent back, but Oh, he didn't even he yeah, didn't even did. get to go ride it at all. <laughs> yeah. No, I went straight back. Well, I found the most impressive is he never said anything about it until it got to the house. Smart. I mean, if I was oh. six years old and ordered me a motorbike, I'd be like, ha ha, every day I'd be out there looking for my motorbike. <laughs> he never said yeah. anything until the box got there. No, he knew enough Jeez. that he's like, you guys could cancel the order. He's like, but if it gets here, there's potential I get to keep <laughs> this <fine>. thing. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. was hoping you guys didn't notice it show up and all that, really. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty funny. God dang. He's pretty excited. <laughs> said, I can't wait. My new motorbike. Yeah, I would have got my ass whipped if that would have happened to me <laughs> at that yeah. age. Well, um, did you ever live up here in, like, Washington, or did you always live down there in Texas? Well, you know, like, when I was a, a real little kid, we were in Montana. We moved from Montana to Texas, and I grew up down here. I was, I don't know, I was pretty little when we moved down here. And then, uh... Like I said, mm -hmm. when, I got out of, when I got out of school, my parents moved back, and I, I mean, I didn't ever live there. I didn't know anybody, so I stayed here. So, yeah, there was really no reason for me to go. I, I mean, I visited a lot, but, you know, I never really lived there. Yeah, I never got the want or dream to actually move back up this way. Yeah, I mean, Washington. I, yeah, I've always, you know, I owned property in Spokane for a while, and I always thought maybe I'd go there, but, like, now... It's kind of like, well, I sold it to my brother. I, I just moved to a different part of Texas. Like, figured if I'm going to go, maybe I'll go later, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I, it was just, you start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel as far as, like, work and stuff goes. And you're like, oh, yeah, well, maybe if I stay here just a little longer and <laughs> work it out. Just make know? a little bit more, and then I can make it happen. It's a road with no end, man. That's what it is. Yeah. Like, it's like a hamster on a wheel. You're like, yeah, I got a little more, a little more, a little more, and you just never quite get there. Well, no. So, I don't know. That's what we did. So we moved. I moved a couple of years ago from like the Houston area over west of Austin, north of San Antonio, really. Well, like. Uh, Cause you were in Magnolia, right? Yeah, I was in Navasota or Anderson, but yeah. it was uh, close to Magnolia. I'd work in Magnolia every day. I lived in Magnolia a long time. Then we moved to Navasota. But I'd drive down to Magnolia and work every day. I don't know. I guess I was probably around there for 20 years. But. 
Yeah, because I thought that time, a couple times that I'd come down to your place, I thought it was like Magnolia area. Yeah. But maybe it was correct. Navasota, but I don't remember but really. Not that far apart, 20 miles, so same difference. Really. So but how I'm, long have you been like shoeing horses until like you got into like competitive horseshoeing and like started competing and, you know, making oh, that jump? You know, I, we, I did a little competing when I was young with my dad. We'd do like some two-man classes and things like that when I was real little. Mm-hmm. We did like a three-man draft shoeing at Oklahoma or something when I was like 12. So, well, we won. We did Dang, okay. 12? Nope. Yeah. The old man drug me around and did it. But Were you swinging the sledge for him or? Well, I'm trying to, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure it was useless, that's... but. <laughs> but we did. But Just it was for, there you know, like for... babysitter. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like when I was little, we'd go a little bit. And then, you know, like, I guess tell, like, my dad left. <laughs> And then I didn't, I just went to work and I didn't compete a lot. And then probably like 2007 or eight, something like that. I started going a fair amount. But so that was like, is that when you started going and started like you were trying to make the AFT then? Correct. Yeah. I mean, that's when I was decided that would be a goal. So cause what, how many times did you make it? I think I went three times, but I qualified a lot. Yeah. I don't know how many times I qualified. Probably from 2008 to however many times I went to the convention, I probably would have qualified. Yeah, every time almost then. Yeah, roughly. I mean, so it would have been 8 to 15 or 14 or something. So why did you turn it down? Like, what would be a reason on why you wouldn't want to do the team if you would qualify? Well, just, just the time aspect of it, you know, like... I always enjoyed doing it, but like, if you've done it two or three years in a row and you worked it for a year or two to get there by like year five or six, it's getting to be a strain, you know? So I was. Yeah, just, just being there and having to do everything over and over yeah. and all the practicing. And... Right. Like with the team, it's not so bad just going to some competitions and practicing for that stuff, but like then when you get on the team, like you have teammates and stuff, you can't like just phone it in for that, you know? So. I mean, it's a commitment that you have to be fairly serious about. And nobody, yeah, likes, nobody wants to go compete internationally and get strummed. You know, you want to go do as good as you can. So. Well, that's kind of, you know, why we get into it. It's competitive, right? And you want to win, so yeah, no sense sure. yeah, in going I mean, there just to play second. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, second's bad. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> so after, after like was... 2015, then, is that when you guys started doing... I think I, I met you when you were on the team with Josh Stanley, and I'm not sure who else, yeah. but you guys flew into Portland, and somebody, yeah. like, just threw it on me there right before to, like, go pick you guys up at the airport, and I was probably been, like, shoeing yeah. horses for, like, two years, pretty dead broke, and, like, we blew a tire <laughs> on the way back to my house, like, taking oh, yeah. you guys to the hotel, <laughs> like... It was a it was a wreck. <laughs> it wasn't that that great of a first introduction. No, it's you know stuff happens, but yeah, that would have been about 2014. That was me and Josh and uh, Ben and uh, Rusty. Uh, we had did the team that year. So, oh, Rusty. Yep. Oh, yeah. Rustin Timberlake. <laughs> just so everyone knows. Just everyone. Rustin Timberlake <laughs> Rustin Timberlake, yep Is he a singer or what? No, everybody always said he looks like Justin Timberlake So I started calling him Rustin Timberlake <laughs> Rustin Timberlake, alright so That's his nickname until I die until anyway. I... <laughs> Well, everybody else is going to hear it now You know, now I you put it up on blast so. I hope so. <laughs> <coughs> But after that, you guys uh, started good. doing, like, uh, Cat 6 then, huh? Yeah, we did that. I don't even know when we started doing that, but we did it four or five times, probably. It was a good time. It was a fun team, too, yeah. Who came up with the name Cat 6? I don't remember. I think we were going to call ourselves the Hurricanes, and then I was like, well, we, it needs to be a, a fairly significant hurricane if we're going to be the Hurricanes. So yeah. we called ourselves the Cat 6. That makes... Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I was always thinking it was like 
because they had, in the WCB, the top category is category four. So I always, always think, and you guys were just like placing you guys above that. But I didn't think it was anything to do with an actual. Yeah, that that was the reason I. We could be category six. I mean, uh, That's yeah. completely what I, I thought mean, it you was. up to the name. <laughs> yeah. I thought you guys were just playing, your, placing yourselves above. And I mean, you yeah. did it. Well, you know, we're fairly arrogant, but I don't think we're that arrogant. <laughs> What what was it like being on a team? Like, you were already on some pretty good teams, but like that team was pretty. You guys stacked it up pretty pretty well. So like, was it pretty easy going of coming up with like a system and everything, or how was it? Yeah, I mean, as long as as long as everybody listened to me, it was great. But you know, it's when they got off track it was a problem. <laughs> Right. So we yeah. just come out with a ruler or something or just let them no, out? No, no. Everybody had competed so much. I'm just kidding. Everybody on that team had competed so much that it really wasn't a great big issue. We just had to figure out who was going to do what, you know. And then there's some years that we practiced a lot and were pretty focused, and then there was some years that we didn't really fool with a lot. We just went and had a good time, you know. So it was always, it was always fun. But Gene and I had competed a ton together, so it was – I mean, that part of it was really easy. You just did what you were going to do, you know? But, yeah. And then just kind of figuring out what Austin and Mark were doing and then do it together. It's pretty simple. Well, you make it sound yeah, like simple. Yeah, but... you make it sound so simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, everybody had been pretty seasoned at that point, so it wasn't like I mean, you weren't trying to figure out, like, okay, what are we going to do? Like, the guy that goes first knows what he has to do. The guy that goes last knows what he has to do. The guys in the yeah. middle got to try to stay out of the way or give everybody enough time to get decent scores, you know, that kind of stuff. But it wasn't it wasn't bad. You know, like, certain guys fit better at certain positions, you know. Like, I was always better off to go in the middle so I could have just a hair more time. I could get better scores that way. But I don't really care if I was going to go first or last. You just have to figure out who's going to do what and stick with it. But if you go first, you just got to get through it so everybody has time. And you know whoever goes first, like, well, your scores probably aren't going to be high as if you're going third. But, like, I mean, that's, what you, that's part of the deal. It's what you got to do. And the other guys can't be mad at you for it. And then if you leave your end guy with, like, 10 seconds, you know, then, like, can't be mad at him either. Yeah, because he's just getting the uh, the short end of the stick then. Yeah. And, yeah, you had to get, like, at that competition, you had to get everybody through. It worked best for us, like, if you got everybody through, like, one at a time so you weren't all bungled up in the vice. You know, so, like, you let your first guy go fastest. And then, you know, you'd have your second guy a little bit behind, and a third guy a little bit behind, and a fourth guy a little bit behind. And if everything mm -hmm. went right, nobody was any, in anybody's way. Like... Yeah, it kind of makes sense. So you, everybody. So was you like guys were never starting and stop. You guys were never starting and stopping anybody. They when they would start. Yeah. And go all the way, all the way through. We would go like uh, if you were first, that's what you did. Like Mark. Oh no, I'm sorry. It was uh, Gene and Austin were doing fronts. I think yeah, Gene and Austin did fronts for most of the years. And they would go start on their shoes, and then and me and Mark would start trimming, and I was third, so I'd, as soon as I was done trimming, I'd leave Mark over there, and then Austin would go, go over and, yeah, I think Austin would go over and trim when we were done, and Gene would stay there and get a little bit ahead on his shoe. But Austin, whoever was first, Austin was always first. He just had the right away. Whatever he needed, whenever he needed it, we'd just get out of his way so he could get through. And he mm -hmm. was usually going on like at like an hour 10, you know, if he was doing that, then, like, Gene would just be, like, 20 minutes behind him, and then I'd be 20 minutes behind him. But the last guy always feels real nervous because, like, you never think you're going to have enough time. But then if you got, like, 45 minutes and everything, everybody's done, you know, like, it would, it went pretty quick. You felt like you had a lot of time then, you know. But, you, but the whole time you just feel like you're getting nothing done. And then you got three guys done, and their fourth guy's, like, got the whole thing to himself for almost an hour so. Like it worked pretty when it went to schedule everything everything went great but you know it goes i always had to make two shoes or something but. did you guys ever have a time where somebody had to make two shoes in a go like oh, on I the did. day i did it twice oh really that didn't matter we won both times so it was all right <laughs> yeah i always had to make two draft shoes burn it or do something stupid 
turn it backwards, you know. Yeah. I'm I'm really good at making the wrong side. I do that pretty oh, pretty yeah. often during our practices. So ignorant. <laughs> like, I'm so ignorant, man. I gotta put like 32 center dots yeah. on this. So I know what's what. <laughs> so what? So once you guys got like to this point, what was it like the first time you ever went on to like AFT? What was that experience like? Like having yeah. not really been on a four man team or before? Yeah, like, what it was, was that like it was a bit different. The, the two guys we were on the team with, I didn't know very well. So, you know, you figure out how you got to work with those guys. And like the first year you go on the team, you're just so excited to be there that it can't be bad. So you're just like, oh, it's still cool. And then looking back yeah. on it, you're like, well, you know, maybe it wasn't quite as cool as I thought, but it's still cool. But who were uh, who were the other three on it that year? I don't me even and know. Gene, and then Troy Price and Jim Foy, and Bob Slansky uh, okay. was the alternate, and it was it was fine. We did fine, you know, like, but they were in a different area of the country, and I didn't know them very well. So you know, you get to know them, and then start working together as a team. You know, it was, it was all right. Did Gene and you uh, know each other very well at that point, or was that kind of yeah? We had been practicing to... together, trying to trying to make the team. So oh, okay, you know, we made the first time we went, we made made the team the same year. So it was pretty fun. Yeah, but we practiced a lot. Like, and then from there, we practiced together for years. You know, trying to get stuff figured out. And... So then you guys were on it the uh, second time you were on it in '09. Uh, correct. Yeah, nine. Yeah. No, I don't think he did it after that. He went to, he went on the WCB team a time or two, I think, but I never did. I never did get mm. to all of them to qualify. I kind of wish I would have, but just at that point, I just, you know, like I said, after five or six years, it starts to get, and I, and I, start, I had my two boys, and then it started to get a little more difficult to be away, and, you know, not that, you know, kids are a great excuse to stop doing something so intense, so. Yeah. Because well, you get to the point where it's like you can't – I didn't want to spend as much time in the shop preparing. And then, like, if you're not competing well, it's not because you can't compete well. It's because you're not preparing to compete well. It's just like, well, what's the point? You know, like, once you're to the open division, you've accomplished and accomplished most of the goals that you've set out. You know, it's like at this point, you're just going to stomp your friend's guts out. You know, it's like, well – and if you can't do that, it's just like, well, I don't have any interest What's in that. What's the point? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, unless you can go, like, win, it's like, well, or at least have a shot at winning, you know? Mm-hmm. And you could, I could go, guys that are real tuned up could go do well and not have to practice a ton. Then if you have time and want to spend the money and the time away, it's great. Like, I always enjoy going, but it's, it just got to where the commitment for the practicing and then the commitment and the being away and it was just too much. So I backed off. Did it ever like uh, affect your actual shoeing business? You know, like having to be away, competing on the shoeing teams and anything well, like I'm that. Sure, or kind of... but at the time, you know, you don't really care. I mean, it's. It, yeah, I, yeah, I probably shot more right. horses than most guys. I've always done a lot. You know, like a fair number, and it. Oh yeah. It just got to where like, when you're home, you're always working, and then you're away every other weekend or whatever it is. You know, it just got. But if, if, if you wanted it to work out for your business, you either had to shoe a smaller number of horses or you had to work a lot. And, I, you know, I did both. Like when I first started competing, I probably shot a few less horses. And then the longer I competed, like the probably I built it up a little bit and it still took care of both. And it got to be kind of a burden. So, but at that point, I was trying to meet some financial goals and not really like competitive stuff anymore. So it was... You know, that's what I did. Your goals kind of changed a little, changed a little bit, so you kind of just changed a little bit on uh, what you were yeah. trying to achieve then. I mean, like, so, like, horseshoeing is, it's not infinite. Like, you're, you're only going to be able to do so many. You only have so long to get it done. You're only going to be able to shoe so many horses. So you can shoe those horses in the beginning. You can shoe a whole bunch. You can shoe a little bit at the beginning and then do a whole bunch and then taper out, which is what a lot of people do. Or you could do, like, I tried to shoe a bazillion in the beginning and make a bunch of money, keep all your debt down, save a bunch of money, and have your little nest egg and try to make that work as long as possible. So at some point you have a prayer retiring. That's what I did. Yeah. And Hopefully it was, too many motorcycles don't get bought unnoticed. Yeah, man. Stay off Amazon. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, like that was, 
kind of what I uh, what I was doing, and it worked out fine. You know, I've done well, and everything seems good at the minute. So, so is your do you feel like your body? Do you feel like though your body's kind of paying for doing a bunch of horses in the beginning, or you were young enough that it didn't get? Well, I don't hit? think it really matters if you do. Yeah, it doesn't really matter if you do five a day, ten a day, twelve a day. Like you're gonna feel good until about year fifteen or tw- well, probably year twenty. And then you're just, it doesn't matter after that. You're just not going to feel good. Like, maybe Have you been shooting horses like 20 years? Who, me? Yeah, well, yeah, I shot a long time. 24, 25. 24, 25. I'm old, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't look it. <laughs> I mean, look, I got no hair. <laughs> Fell out. Fell out, landed on my back. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm no, sure it's... it'll happen to me eventually anyways. I've been shooting full time. I think since like '97 or '8, so Man. pretty good while. Yeah. Yeah. So do you you don't shoe a ton of horses in the day right now? Then. Oh, probably more than most. Yeah. What's your average day? I do you mean, still. Like, uh... So if I go by myself, like I'm gonna shoot. I'm, I'll do four or five sets, you know, and then. But most of the time, I intend to go out and do four or five sets. And I'll go out and do four or five sets and be like, ah, well, I'll stop off and do these couple half sets and some trims. Oh, so-and-so called. I'll run over here and do this one, too. Yeah, it's just what happens. But, like, like an average day when I was working at Magnolia a lot, I'd probably shoe six to nine, do a handful of half sets and trims, you know, every day. When I had, like, my brother worked for me some, and I had to help a lot when I was in Magnolia almost. You know, I had to help three four days a week. But you Sometimes shoe, you know, a lot of days he'd shoot 12, 14. It's pretty yeah, that's crazy. a pretty good amount, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, it's a lot. Were you shooing that many? Do you not care travel? Were you shooing that many when you were on a team? Oh, yeah. And so then when were you working in practice? That night. <laughs> just stay, just staying in it. Oh, that's the only time <laughs> yeah, to do it. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, uh, I think that's where people get confused. They're like, "Oh, this guy competes, so he must not be shooing any horses." Because there's no, no one works, that, that you know, past five o'clock. Like that's unheard of. That wasn't, that wasn't the case for me. I mean, it was, uh, it was. You know, I, I work a lot in the practice at night. Yeah. But, and and by I, you know, I don't know if I practiced a lot. I probably would practice a couple hours at night. Go have a couple goes at something, you know. I never did much warming up because I never really had time, but that's not how you compete anyway. I'll just go cut steel and have a go at the class, you know. I'd do that twice probably, three, four nights a week, and then like one full day on the weekend, like give it a good six, eight hours or whatever. So you just that's flat out just run the class under time and just build the shoes that way versus like uh, – I'd figure them out figure first. Out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'd figure them out first, you know, like what, what I was going to do and then – then I run the class and figure out like uh, how how much time I had to cut off and then see what see what you had to do, you know. But, uh, do you think uh, are you guys gonna do the uh, the Cat Six team in the future anymore, or what are you guys planning with that? I can't imagine. But Man, like all all our team quit showing horses. But like Blink One Eighty Two just came back, Nickelback just came back out. Like it would just be be perfect. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always the chance of a hell freezes over to it. Yeah. <laughs> like Gene quit shoeing horses. Austin quit shoeing horses. It's just me and Mark. Shoeing wow, now. I did not know that about Gene. I think Austin said he might go back to it, so we might have some luck. We might get him back. But Gene quit shoeing horses. <laughs> Damn. I don't know. It's been a year or so ago. He pretty slowed way down, and then he sent me a text the other day. It's the last one. <laughs> That's the pictures of two feet on there. It is over. That last out. one, they stuck with it, huh? Hey, ain't lying. It. Shit. Yeah. Well, it's so it's nice know. making money in the shop, though, <laughs> and not being under horses. Yeah, it's it's pretty good to make a few bucks standing up, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> I'm with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not a... Like I said, after 20, 25 years, you just get beat down, you know? It's like... I, I could still go do a lot, but I just can't do it every day like I did. You know, I prefer, yeah. you know, if I'm going to have some busy days, just try to have, like, two busy days a week instead of five or six, you know. And I guess what's busy, like, what kind of shoeing are you doing or what do you, you know, some stuff's easier than others, you know. 
What type of shoeing do you do? Still you still just do like? I used to. I shot like only dressage horses for like 15 years, and then since I've moved, I do just like a little bit of everything, which is the worst thing to do. Cause like you yeah. have to keep so much stuff or you have to have a whole bunch or make a bunch of stuff or, I mean, you gotta have like the whole supply house in your truck. It's, it's for the birds. Yeah, really. I hate that. You know, it is what it is. It's, it's an area that I like to live in. So it's good. So did you move up a little bit farther North then, or is it no, South? Like, uh, it's like four and a half hours West of where I used to live at. I'm like oh, 50 okay. miles West of Austin and about 50 miles North of San Antonio. So is there anybody else, like, as far as horseshoers go, like, that you know live nearby there? Or oh, yeah, there's millions who's... of them. Todd, Todd just lives on the street, Todd Walker. Oh. oh, nice. I live about 30 minutes from, a eh, half hour, 45 minutes from Austin now. Like, so there's there's a lot of guys around. I go work on the west side of Austin most days, Dripping Springs area, New Brunswick. Okay. So up and down 35 there. I remember about... uh, in your shop, like, you had a couple rooms in there for like uh with grinders and stuff do you make much uh knives anymore yeah i haven't had time lately i do some you know when i get time but everything's kind of been on the back burner moving and stuff like it was moving took a little while i didn't really want to like just move over here and twiddle my thumbs and wait to get busy so i was working in houston and over here at the same time i'd work mm -hmm. like well at first i would work like i would just set aside like one day a week and come over here and did what needed to do and or like it always kind of just took precedence to all the other stuff. When people called from over here, I just drop what I'm doing and come over here. And then slowly, you know, you just kind of switched it over. It got a little busier and I do two days a week. And then for a little over a year, I was over here like four days a week and then working in Houston three days a week. So it was rough. But How long did that transition take until like you fully got away from Navasota area to where you're at now? A couple of years probably. Oh shit! Do you still go down wild. south? Or I just have like me? one farm I go over there for. I just go knock it out in two days. But it's like nothing. <laughs> Whole nothing. farm, nothing. Yeah, like, <laughs> like twenty or twenty-two. It's not too bad. But anyway, but that's you know, like I didn't, like I said, I didn't want to move and just tell all my whole business in Houston. Like, sorry, I'm not coming back and come over here and just sit around, you know. So right. It, it took longer than I had anticipated because, like, in the middle of that, COVID hit, and we were building a home over here, and then it took, like, six months longer to get everything done with the house and all that garbage, you know. It took forever. So and then you couldn't get anybody to build a shop, so that took longer than expected. Everything took longer than expected, but it's fine. Yeah. It's, all, it's all getting there, getting close to being done. My shop's pretty much done. We've got power in it, all the stuff I've just got to do few more things got to do a little build out you know stuff like that so you're gonna get back to the knife making after that? that yeah oh yeah I, I always make a few you know but i just don't i've never made just like loads and loads of them but you know i always just when i in my spare time I'll no them. you are, you guys are making some super sweet folding knives right like yeah yeah, yeah i do make a fair amount of damascus and make some uh, lock you know some liner locks and you know, hunting knives, all different kinds of stuff. Who taught you how to make those? Where'd you, uh... So, a friend of mine that I shot horses, that shot horses around Magnolia, a guy called Charlie Majors, I was, I was hunting, and then, like, uh, I was like, well, I got a, a really nice knife for a Christmas gift, and I was like, well, I don't know how to make this. Seems easy, you know? Charlie, I knew Charlie made some, so I called Charlie, and I was gonna have him show me how to do it, and... He showed me how to make a few, and then I just kind of went from there. <laughs> yeah, Char anyway. Charlie seems like a really cool guy. I've talked to him some on the internet and stuff, and like super talent, oh, talented yeah, guy. Nice guy. Like, yeah, that's yeah, I like Charlie real well. He was pretty patient with me, you know, bothering him all the time about not making or whatever. So. Yeah, that's a pretty intricate little like thing to do. I, it's tedious. I have zero interest in folding pocket knives right now. Like at this point. Yeah, it's tedious. And then like the liner locks, you know, Austin helped me along with those. And then uh, I took a another folder class at Jim Pores uh, about a year ago or so. You know. Oh, just with uh, Rick and Bill. I to take some classes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Bill Bill Burke yep. is the clinician, I think. 
at gym shop. Nice fella. Yeah, he's super anyway, nice and super talented guy. Yeah. I just you ever see that in like the uh, former retirement when you slow down from shooting horses going into like the knife making type deal or it's just like, like negative $4 an hour. I don't know how anybody make a living at it. <laughs> yeah. I just feel with it. I don't know. You know, it's just something I like to do. So I don't know that I've ever made it really made any money on it, but it's, it's a good way to kill a little time, I guess, make something useful. Yeah, the ones I've seen, they look pretty freaking sick. Like, pretty damn yeah. nice. But yeah, they last a lot longer. Yeah. and going to get used a lot more than just uh, this time we spend on a yeah, roadster. Cool, you know, you can, <laughs> like, exactly. Like, like, you can make your dad a pocket knife, and he's going to like it. You can go make your dad a roadster, and he's going to be like, oh, yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was your was your dad more impressed with your knife-making skills than your, your shoe-making, <laughs> or what? I don't know, man. I, if you know my dad, like him. Yeah. Not much press is old Jeff. He don't. It's hard Pretty to say. Pretty cut and dry. <laughs> it's hard to say. I don't. I don't know that he's impressed with either. Really, but. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, most of the time I only ever really seen him smile is when if he got like free diet Pepsi. Yeah, there you somebody go. Somebody came in and I said, "Yeah, give him a piece of cake, cake, something like that. He'll be all right. He likes the sweets." That's funny. No, I gave him. We went elk hunting a few weeks ago, and I gave him a pocket knife. He seemed pretty happy with that. Did you come? Did you go hunting yeah. in, or in Washington then with him? Yeah, Idaho. Yep. Oh, nice. That's uh. Yeah, we went. You uh, said, that's something uh, Austin was talking about too. Of like, uh, he said to ask you about your pack trips you take with your dad. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, my brother packs with has packed with him a lot, like for the last twenty years. I've just gone the last handful of years. But they do like my dad's got a little pack string and they go like uh it's off the north fork of the clearwater river i don't know it's i guess it would be north of the salmon river i don't know mm -hmm. the exact area but anyways it's it's fun it's like you go way down the forest service road and then uh it's like seven miles six seven miles off the trail or something it's pretty good pretty good ways it's pretty remote how long does he like go off packing for then like a week this year we were gone for nine days yeah that's pretty cool are you guys you guys hunting rifle or are you guys hunting with a bow uh we were rifle hunting this oh, year nice. nice that's yeah it's, taking a, wall it's an early season in then yeah they've got all that equipment but there's a. Uh, an early season i think that high in the wilderness area i think the season is like earlier than like the general season yep. in that unit so it's like uh it starts i think the second week in september and goes to like through the first week of october it's three or four weeks you guys are there, hunting bulls and rut hunt. then yeah trying to dude we're trying to is that these. did you guys get one this year <laughs> no my brother shot a nice one last year did he? i think oh yeah Four out of the last five years, somebody's got a bull in oh, there. Sweet. So that's uh, it's been, they've been pretty successful hunting there. That that's yeah, that's above average because I think like most average elk hunts in the western side of America are a ten percent or lower it's success like, rate. So I was gonna say it's like ten percent. It's not very yeah, high. It's yeah. not. You watch it on TV and it looks really easy, but it's not. And the particular yeah, area that we go to, too. they said that the numbers. We talked to the biologist, state biologist. And they said for that area, the numbers are low. So it's, there's elk there and you could be successful if you're good at hunting, but you know, I'm just going to see my dad, visit with my brother and you know, that kind of stuff. Good so, place to go good. do it at right there. That's a, yeah, yeah. You know, phone service or let your customers freak out. For two <laughs> yeah, <weeks or> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys bump into any, it was all the better when there's yeah, no service. You guys bump into any wolves back there? I know I haven't seen any. A few years ago, uh, Jesse shot a bull, and then I guess like on the carcass, they, they saw some a few days later. But that's really the only ones they've seen. Oh, nice. So. That's not too bad. Then. But I think that there's a no. There's there's a fair number around. You know, yeah. you can you see signs, but mm -hmm. you know they don't. The elk act a little different, I guess. My dad said that they stop bugling like not like they used to. They do. You know? Yeah, they really they really start. Tuning in, that they uh, yeah they realize that the 
them rutting and bugling or bringing in packs of wolves, so they just shut up. Yeah, I think they're pretty hard on them, so they don't like you. You don't hear that many bugling whenever you're hunting. So yeah, which is crazy because then like, you get like where I live, where you're like kind of in farm country with elk, you know, and they're running around bugling their heads off because <laughs> they're pretty protected. Yeah, there's no pressure for them. Uh, it's different, yeah. And I've, you know, I've, I've gone and hunted them on private ground, and it's, it's that way, you know. Yeah. It's like, man, this is easy. Yeah, it's a different but deal. <laughs> it is private ground season. So, do you hunt down in Texas a good amount? Yep, yep, I do. Hunt some. Nice. Just white tail and that kind of stuff, you know. Is that what you were doing this past weekend, then? Yeah, I went bow hunting. Yeah. You bow hunting for white tail. Did you guys have any success? No success. No deer were harmed in my deer hunting excursion. <laughs> Which is off in the case. Yeah. You guys got a bunch of yeah, random yeah. stuff down in Texas, though. A bunch of uh, exotics and things like that. that like... They do in places, yeah, for sure. Like, the area that we live in now is like, oh, you know, like, it, it's all on game ranches, but it's gotten loose over the years. So, yeah. You, you see stuff, like... Not so much right here. You get a little further west, and there's, there's. A, it sounds like there's a fair, not, fair amount of it. But. Okay. Yeah, that's something I see all the time. Is like people will post, uh, or post pictures of basically big bucks that they've killed, but they leave out the fact that they caught, like, shot it in a game farm. You know, where it's been trapped for however many years here. to get that yeah. size. And I don't know. I don't. We've. All, I grew up just tagging along with my dad and stuff. Like it's just been family time for me. You know way to hang mm -hmm. out it doesn't really matter to me if i get anything or not it's always you know, it's always okay but yeah we process it all here at the house and feed the family with it it's good no it's for like for me too it's like a uh i don't always get something that's like the whole like you're saying but it's like a destined time that i'm gonna take a break from working because if not i'm just i just yeah. catch myself working again like so it is a, a yeah, guaranteed yeah, so vacation. You have to set the time aside. Yeah, it's for sure. Relax and get away from stuff for a little while, you know. Kind of get burned out if you don't take a little time for yourself. Yeah. Is that something that you think you've Absolutely. learned more, like, after being on teams and stuff, or, like, since kids, that, like, how to relax a little bit more? I guess, no, not really. I mean, like, seems like we're kind of always on the go, but... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. It's tough, man. Getting the work-life balance thing is difficult. Like, you know, when we were first married, Kate was working, so it was a little easier to maybe not do so much, but then your responsibilities at home are a lot more. It's just a different thing, you know? Like, like if Kate went back to working now, I'd have to spend more time getting kids and helping with school and doing that kind of stuff. But Kate's home, so she takes care of, like, everything, and I just work. So it's it's hard to... There's a know. balance that's... Yeah, so you're always just working, and you feel pressure to take care of everybody. And do you... I mean, how much do you work? How much do you need? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I've always just worked because I'm just a workaholic. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, just you could, that, you probably catch yourself then just, just working then. You're like, well, I... You don't have to worry about, like, balancing it if you just keep going all one way, you know? like. Yeah, that's true. And Because you, you find yourself doing it because that's what you've always done. And what puzzles me is, like, your free time shouldn't be, like, a reward for working hard. You should just have some free time so you're not dead. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it, I find myself, like, well, I can get through all this, then I can, make, I can go hunting for a week or I can go fishing or whatever, whatever it is. And then you feel like, oh, well, I did all this hard work so I could... <laughs> I just felt like, like you're trying to reward yourself because you were doing what you should have been doing. It's just a, it's just dumb. You should just work less and take more time for yourself and just learn how to live on less. But it's hard to do. Super hard. 2022, it's hard to figure that out. You know? Tell me about it. It's been hard for me since forever. Yeah. When, when she was working, was she shoeing horses then? Um, no, she actually taught seventh grade science, so... When Kate and I first got married, she did like, uh, oh, she would call, finished up college and she would uh, trim horses and stuff and in weekend, weekends and evenings. Even when she was teaching, she would trim horses in the evenings and on the weekends to make cash and stuff. It was pretty good, actually. Yeah. 
But did she like learn to shoe horses from you, or did she go to school for it? She worked for my dad. Oh shit! That's how I met her. She was working for for my dad, and then. Well, that was my next question: Is how did you guys meet then? Yeah, I went. Um, I was at the college. I went up to visit my dad, and you know, she fell in love instantly. The rest of the history. <laughs> she could have. She could have helped herself. <laughs> That's right. She kept calling until I gave in. <laughs> oh man. No, it was. Uh, she had gone through the shoeing program and then was working for my dad at the school, and that's where we met. And then, you, know, you were like, do you want to pass this I class? Probably, <laughs> like, yeah. I wore her down. I probably bothered her until she finally gave in and said yes. You know. It's been good. We've been married 20 years this year, I think. 2000, yeah, we got married 2000. Was she from so. up from the Northwest? Yeah, Walla Walla. Yep. Her whole family's there. Oh, man. Oh, no shit. So we got married, and she moved down here. And that's what I said. We had always kind of intended to go back, and then just never did. Right. She's pretty mad at me about it, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been 20 years down there, so here's what yeah. it is. Yeah, I think one day we'll make it back that way. I just don't quite know when. Well, then what's, uh, what's on the horizon for Jake Engler these days, then? Man, I don't know. It's working. Go to a Shoot lot of horses. baseball games. Go to a lot of kids' baseball games. Yeah, stuff like that. Kids are pretty big into baseball. and. Yeah, my oldest son likes sports. baseball, football, basketball. Yeah. My youngest one likes to play golf, so I try to appease him. I'm horrible at golf, but... I was just about to ask, do you ever swing the clubs in with him? Yeah, I try to go. It's pretty hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not very good at it. But he likes to go, so I try to help him with it. Do you you ever catch yourself, like, I I worry about, my kid's still pretty young. She's three, so it's like I'm a ways away from it. But, like, I worry about, like, I like to practice pretty hard, so I worry about pushing that on her. Do you ever feel like you're pushing them competitively? No. No, because that's, I mean, I get, like, when I was competing, I was, like, pretty hyper-focused on it. But, like, so, like, with Ian's baseball and stuff, like, it's really time-consuming. And so, like, I had to talk with him this year. It's like, well, you know, you can, if you want to play all the time, that's fine. But we spend a lot of time doing this. So, like, if you don't love it, let's find something that you love. Let's go do something different that you want to spend all this time with. Like, so, he said he likes it, but... You know, I like I I, I don't I'm not gonna make them practice. I'm not gonna make them do it. Like if you love it and you want to do it, then great. I'm all in. Let's go do it. However much time you want. But like cool. if you don't, let's go do something different. Let's find something that you like that well. Because it's not if you're gonna be spending all weekend at the ball fields and you're gonna be playing baseball, you know, two, three, four nights a week or whatever it is. Like if you're just out there because you think I want to watch it or because you think that your friends want you to play or, like, don't do that. Just, like, find you're something you really like. You're out there for the wrong like. reasons. Yeah. So, like, it's just a waste of time unless you love it. So. so is baseball his, like, favorite one out of the three? I think so. He likes baseball, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we go. He plays plays every year, you know. plays a lot. It was sounds. Did you ever play, like, any sports? When you're like his age or anything, or just know, straight to work with dad? This body was not made for fitness, my friend. <laughs> no. I was built for feed, not for speed, so. <laughs> just swinging hammers. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Feed. Oh, man. That is good. Yeah, I've never been the model of fitness, so. As much as I tried. Well, you know, as a kid, we played a little bit of sports, but not a lot, you know. Yeah. Just off to work with that. Did a lot of that, yeah, yeah. for sure. Every spare minute, man, that was, that was the deal. I remember him telling a story one time. Uh, it was something to do with, like, why don't you have a grinder in your truck? He's like, why well, need a grinder when I've got a 13-year-old son right there that can hot rasp everything or something like that. And he was I just pouring over to you. I was like a 200-pound <laughs> grinder. Yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah. Yeah, he went minimalist before he left town or whatever. And it was like, we just hot box or hot rest everything. So, you know. How many uh, How many years was your dad on the air AFT? 
I don't really remember. It was a long time ago. It'd been early nineties. Once, yeah. twice. I don't know. Yeah, I don't quite remember either. I know he'd been on it, but I don't know how many times. Yeah, I don't know if I know he went once. But I don't know if he qualified and didn't go or didn't or stop I know he fairly well stopped competing after he went. Went to a little bit yeah. of local stuff, you know, but not a lot after that. But, so is he even is he fully given up on shooting horses yet? Or is he still shooing? Oh, or? man, she's like a savage. She make all us look lazy. Jeez Louise, man. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna run out half day and go shoot do five sets. Yeah. Sixty eight. Half day. <laughs> God damn. I talked to him the other day. I was coming home from Fort Worth and I called to see how he was doing. And he told me he had done like Seven sets and some half sets and nine trims or nine sets and nine trims. I mean, it was it was more than what I did, and I was like, "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> She's weak. Savage. She's putting us all to shame. God when he was there damn. at the college, he would do like, you know, you know how he did, Gavin. He'd work till two o'clock and then go shoot five or six sets after that. Yeah, it dropped me off at like nine o'clock at night. So we did. That's what was my life growing up. Yeah, it was all the time, man. So do you you catch yourself trying to avoid that now though? Now that you're kind of like roles reverse, or you're just like you're working the same. Well, you think like you know you have this. You think like oh I'm never gonna do that, and then you look up for 20 years. It's exactly what you've been doing. You know, I don't know. I don't know if you can fight the genetics or not. But and then I keep saying like oh this is the dumbest thing. I'm gonna slow down. It's so stupid. And then you turn around. And you're like well I did like 50 sets this week. You know? like, <laughs> just we the same shit. I don't yeah. know. I don't know if it's possible. Yeah, at some point you probably just yeah, have to like, accept it, huh? <laughs> yeah, or just like accept the fact that that's. I don't know. I don't know what you do. Uh, and some your boys. Your body, at some point your 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 body will make you stop. Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, for sure. Physically, yeah, or mentally, you do. I mean, and your gonna, boys, they don't have any interest in wanting to shoe horses at all. Well. Like, Ian wants to go. He's 12, but he's like, you don't ever let me do anything. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, I, I knew you. Like, you're 12. You can't, you're 12. Like, you can't do all the prompts. <laughs> it takes you 45 minutes to get four shoes off. Like, yeah, we have time, but go ahead. But like, Well, what did your dad do when you were 12? Same thing. Holler at me. I don't know. <laughs> I swept a lot of manure and stuff like that. But Ian wants to be like working on the horses and doesn't understand why he why you know some of them he can't yeah. you know. but he's getting last couple of years he's he's grown up some like he could probably get punished a little bit this summer mm -hmm. take him along a little bit maybe change his mind but, suffer the heat some yep so is all is you're not going to try to keep him from becoming horseshoers though huh oh it's like I, I don't care what they do as long as they like it yeah no, I think that's a good, good one. I mean, that's, I mean, like I was saying before, you know, like, what do you, I mean, as long as they're not writing home for money, what the heck? I don't, what are you going to do? Yeah. But if, if that's what they want to do, I'll help them with it. But you'd like to, to think, you know, you always want your kids to do better than you, you know, and, I, and I've done fairly well. So yeah. it's, you know, if that's what he wants to do, I'll help him. I'll help him do exactly what I do. Yeah. But if it doesn't, you know, like I said, if you don't love it, go find something yeah. you do. Yeah, and that's cool. It's no, no use spending your time and money on it, and you waste all the energy and the effort if it's something you don't like. And when do you know okay. that? You, really, you know what I mean? You almost don't know until it's too late, almost, right? And yeah, you all, right. then you're coulda, woulda, shoulda, you know, type mentality. Yeah. So do you? You know, I don't know. When is it too late to change course? I don't know. I don't think right. it ever, like, ma like, man, you see people all the time, they're like 60 years old and they're changing what they're doing. And most of, like, sometimes they're successful at it. Like, yeah. But sometimes they go broke. Sometimes they go broke as shit. <laughs> like, that is very true. I'm just saying. That is very like, true. I don't know. The new, new things are scary. Like, <laughs> like, it is. I mean, it for sure is. But I mean, my point is, like, they're so young now. Like, I got started real young, and I don't know that I'd want to start my kids that young. I want them to be a little older. And I got shown a lot of stuff and got a chance to do a lot of neat things when I was young that I wish I could have waited a little longer on. You know what I mean? Like, I probably would have got more out of it and been, been able to utilize it better and appreciate it more if I was just a little bit older, you know? Oh, like working with certain people or something like that? 
yeah i mean going places and doing stuff like that you know yeah for sure you know? like as far as like other career options or job options or something like that or no i mean just the shoeing just the shoeing stuff like I mean, oh. like, I got some opportunities to work with some pretty, pretty good dudes, and I was like real young, and it, and you learn, and you and you do the the stuff they show you, but you don't know why or how, or and you're just like, I asked they told me to do, and you go to work. But it, it would have been, been neat to Who? do it a little later, you know. Yeah. Who were some of the guys that you got to like work with, you know, at a young age or when you were first kind of starting out other than your I always, dad? I used to go with Don in the summer a little bit. My dad's friend Don Gustafson in California. Scotland. And then uh, I went with the ferries a couple of times. Jim and Alan Ferry were nice enough to have me over a couple of times when I was young. I was like 18 or 19. And like I said, you just had no concern for shooting. You just want to go have a good time, you know, so. Yeah. It's so you'd not... go over there to the ferries place, like overseas, right? Correct. Yeah, they're in Scotland, yeah. How that... long were you over there with them? I mean, like five weeks, a month, something like that. I did it twice. Oh, that's We're, cool. I mean, just legends, man. Good guys. Good horseshoers. Real good horseshoers. Yeah. And talk about, talk about work hard, man. Holy cow. Them guys are savage. I've seen, uh, I remember they put out like some uh, draft shoeing like videos or whatever and like the amount of like shoes that they build in a day and just crack them out and, like in three or four heats. I was like, holy shit. Like, yeah, they do a lot. Just like it was nothing. Just like the everyday shoeing. When we were there, I think their business, they told me, Jim told me when I left that they did 60 sets, 66 and a half sets a day the, the, over the four or five weeks I was there. I mean, so it was like... Whoa. I was no good, you know. I couldn't keep up. I was young. I didn't know what to do. Lazy, you know, like. So that's what I'm saying is like if I was a little older, you could have like been more helpful, got more out of it, been it's just, it would have been different, you know, it would have been so like there was a bunch of stuff maybe I wasn't quite ready for that I could have appreciated more when I was older, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But anyways, it was it was really neat. It was a great opportunity. I mean I wouldn't change it, I don't but it was cool. But there was also, they also had a, a half a dozen guys working for them. That was my next question, was how many guys were helping them? I don't really remember the exact number, but there was a fair number. It's like, you know, when... Are the Irish guys there? Uh, yeah, they had like six or eight guys, I think, you know, I don't, but I don't quite know. They had two qualified guys and then some apprentices. Yeah. Shit, that's crazy. 66 and a half. That's what he said. In a day. That's and they had a, at the at the office they had a gal in the office that worked there full time and they had the supply guy Alan was there Alan uh, Murdoch did the supplies okay. you know and they had like I said they had a bunch of apprentices Paul was an apprentice there and then David and then um, I think there's two or three guys there named Paul actually but anyway it was pretty I would good. never get it confusing yeah it's great they were nice enough to suffer through having me be there for a month or whatever it's cool well you said you got to go there twice then right yeah yeah i bet that was pretty cool for them That'd to like then sweet. see you later though going back to stonely and like yeah i mean it's anybody you help you want to see them be successful yeah you know? no at least you didn't sure. just do nothing with it you know like even though you thought that you were young yeah. going over there it was still a like you kept moving forward with all of it yeah you, yeah sure you want to be able to take and use it and do well so oh, man what was it like um preparing for like calgary and things like that was did you have to like practice more to get ready for that versus like the aft team and things like that or is just kind of like continuous just regular old routine no calgary was like your whole life got put on hold for Calgary. That was like 4th of July weekend. So okay. like it gets super hot here. So you always wanted to practice real early for it. The list normally come out like at convention in March. So you get home from convention and get straight on it. Cause it was like going to get hot. Mm -hmm. So you try to do that, get everything figured out and practice before it got too terrible hot. How many, uh, how many years total did you end up going to like Calgary? Four, I think four. Four. Three or four. I didn't. I didn't go as much as a lot of people did. Three or four, I think. 
And then you won it like two or three times, right? Two times, three times? No, I never won Calgary. I was runner up there once. Oh, runner up once. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we'll go I three. misread I something. <laughs> it wasn't, I've never been that good. Uh, I was runner up there one time and I made the top 10 a couple of times. So, yeah. You know, as far as it goes, I mean, there's where all the best guys go. So, it was okay. You know, I was happy with my results. No, that's yeah. doing that's doing good. How like I yep. Calgary ended when I was like beginning, so like I never got to see a Calgary. Was it just a way different like competition in general? Like how the goes were set up and everything? No, not really. I mean they're all I mean, shoemaking classes or they're shoeing classes or they started changing it at the end, and the more they changed it, I thought the worse it got. You know, they'd try to do, like, blind judging, and then they tried stopping the shoeing a few times. You know, like, you get to a certain spot and stop, and everybody would leave, and then the judges would come out and judge. But the more they changed it, the more ridiculous it got. You know, it was like, I thought it was yeah. silly, but, you know, that's what they did, so we all kind of played along, you know, whatever. So, for a while, you know, like the last year or two they did, it was like, they take the horse away to judge it, you know, and they bring it back. And that was that was okay. Oh, just trying to make it more know. blind judging, like so there was no. Yeah, no play favorites. I guess I don't know. I always figured if you couldn't find two judges that didn't play favorites, you needed to find better judges. But yeah, I don't know. It's just me. Because that's how like it's judged. It's it, like like classic it. was judged with three judges, and it seemed like it was always judged pretty fair. Yeah, I didn't ever have any problems with it. You know, like. It doesn't matter what you do, like, to me, like, the judging and the horseshoeing competitions, there's a bunch of it that's just opinion. Like, I like this style, you like that style, you you know, so, like, there's a certain amount of that that you're never going to get around, you know, like, it doesn't, it just doesn't matter, you know what I mean? Like, you, I always did the best, at, you know, I would get upset and try to figure out, oh, he wants this, or he wants to do that, he wants us to do this, but... If I always just did what I liked the best, it normally scored the best. So I've, I, I got to where I just didn't do that anymore. You know, like, so if you just are competing, you. like, you just, you, I had to do what I had to do to get the most points, you know, like, that's just the way it went. So if you stop, I just stopped playing that game, trying to figure out what everybody wanted, just did what I wanted, and I did better. I never, and sometimes it would bite you, but most of the time it was fine, you know. And it, that's how I always got the most points. I never could change last minute and try to make somebody happy and do any good. Right. So, Just do what you got to do. Do what right. you know how to do. I think those are wise if I, Normally, words. if I did what I liked, it was fine. You know, if I liked it, if, like, when I was done, I was like, boy, I like that. It looks pretty good. It normally did pretty good. But, I mean, everybody knows what good is. Like, you just look at it and see it. <laughs> right. I don't know if we're always uh, honest with it, with it though. <laughs> like, it's easy to fall in love with it, yeah. but, you know, it's not a, you know, it always looks good the night you made it, and you go back the next day, and you're like, eh, not so much. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, I think that's wise words. Uh, we don't want to take up too much of your time here, Jake, but I think that's a good one to leave people with is, do what you want, and they're gonna like it or not. <laughs> if you like it, they'll probably like yeah, it. Exactly. Man. Yeah, just put in the work. Thank you very much, Jake, oh. for uh, taking some time away from your family and your busy schedule and chatting with Thanks us for that. a little bit, man. I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. thank awesome. you, Jake. You bet. Thanks. You guys have a good you night. Too. You too. We'll Bye. see you, man. Adios.